Okay, Mr. Buckley, I think we're ready to go. <coughs> okay, call this meeting to order at 8.02 a.m. And as we need to, let me find what I have to read. Pursuant, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee, <clears throat> um, this meeting of the North Reading School Committee, oh, it's missing a fire, it's taking place virtually. No in person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. So we call this meeting to order. It was supposed to originally be a quick five to 10 minute meeting, but there's been some changes that have come up since our last school committee meeting that I'll let Dr. Daly address. Um, I will note that at least one member of the committee does have a conflict starting at 9 a.m. So the hope is that we can have discussion in about 30 to 40 minutes and then be able to vote on a couple of things that Dr. Daly needs approval on before he submits. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Daly, to set the stage. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Buckley. So thank you to everyone for joining this morning. Uh, our topic today is the topic of reopening and the beginning of the school year. Just to remind everyone of the calendar that we're on, um, we have a submission that is due tomorrow. And so we're meeting today for approval of that plan. That plan is not the official reopening plan. That plan is a, it's basically a six or eight questions that are being submitted to the Department of Education for their feedback. They are collecting information to see how many districts are proposing based on the three models that we're looking at in person, remote and hybrid, and coming up with a plan for each of those. They are looking to see how many of us are recommending at this time that they would be starting in either in-person, remote or hybrid. So we will be getting feedback from the department on Tuesday, they've promised, um, to let us know whether what we've submitted is approved. And I'm also thinking we'll get some kind of data about how many districts are, are proposing to come back remote in person or in hybrid. And that is that is the purpose of this. I know that many districts have, have released draft reopening plans. We were asked specifically by the commissioner not to do that until August 10th, um, but many districts are in different places. One of the main drivers of, of those districts is their school days. A lot of them are starting school in late August. Um, I, I felt comfortable sticking with the commissioner's recommended timeline of on around August 10th, because that is um, at least a month away from our first day of school on our current calendar, which would be September 9th. So I feel that parents absolutely need this information as do students, but I feel that the 30 days is reasonable to, to respect what the commissioner is asking us to do, which is to wait for the latest information that's coming available. And a lot is changing every, every day. There, there's a lot coming out at the state level. And so I do, firmly believe that we are going to be well positioned to um, to come up with the best plan. So just to be clear for all the families and community and folks that are on the line, um, what we're proposing today, we've had a, a large working group of over 40 people that have been coming together. That's representative of students, staff, officials from the town, school committee, administrators, teachers, paraprofessionals, secretaries, um, our Special Education Parents Association. Um, so we've had all stakeholders, including our town board of health and our uh, school nurse and our school physician are all part of that group. And so they've weighed in and given us their input and opinions at those meetings um, to develop a plan and a recommendation. But after today, my plan would be, depending on what this group decides this morning, would be to share with the community um, our thinking at this time and to have opportunities for additional parent feedback, student feedback, and you know school feedback, including uh, some public forums. I'm, I'm planning to suggest that we will host some kind of uh, virtual conversations that's open to a larger group um, than, than our typical reopening meetings that are, that are balanced. I would allow anyone who wants to participate to, to come and voice their opinion uh, at those forums. So that's a suggestion that I would have. And then, of course, all that information and data, plus any additional surveys that, that may be suggested by the committee today, I'm happy to put out to inform the actual plan that we hope to have 
out around on or around August 10th. So that's the the timeline and the plan. And um, I'm not sure, Mr. Buckley, if you want to have me present something or if you want to take any questions or I'm not sure how you want to proceed. Well, I, I think I think we can just say that at our last school committee meeting, we talked about the three different plans that were out there that we were that we have to submit. You know, we're, uh, just to be clear, you, you have to submit three different plans out there. The only thing that I think is potentially different is when we last came together, the thought process was we were going to encourage the all in person if we could uh, with three feet apart and face masks. And that is the one, I think the one thing that has changed since our last meeting is where the thinking is about which plan we're going to present. And so perhaps we can talk about what's happened in the last week or two and then and then we can kind of go through the school committee members and talk about what our thoughts are about what plan we should be submitting and then we can open it up to the public if they have specific questions in the chat people can either ask a question or put type their name if they'd like to speak so i think we should just sort of explain you know sort of from last meeting what's happened since then rather than recapping everything that happened you know at that meeting and before Okay, so at this time, you know, when we met last Monday, um, I had met that morning with the with the reopening group, and I had met the previous Friday with the teachers association. I thought we were on one page and one you know one statement that we were prepared. We had done our feasibility study of the school. Um, we were able to open. We believe we were able to open schools at a three foot distance between desks. We felt that the administrators are comfortable that that is. Um, a safe distance to be at and they feel that um, you know that, that we are that we would be able to bring all students back at that distance that three foot distance is something that has been supported by the medical um, board in Massachusetts so the governor has formed a, a board of American um, I'm sorry the Massachusetts board of pediatrics and some other groups as well uh, the WHO has said that for children, they are lower risk of transmitting and that three foot is allowed. The CDC has held at six feet, but they have strongly emphasized the, the importance for students to come back to school. Um, that it's very clear that the CDC thinks students should be coming back to school in person. Um, so we were prepared to move ahead with that three foot. To be honest with you, we are one of the only districts that I'm aware of. I'm, I'm not aware of any other school districts that are recommending as their model in person. Uh, that's not to say there, is, there are not, but I'm in, I'm in multiple groups. I would say I'm in regular contact with 40 to 50 superintendents. The vast majority are discussing a hybrid and we were one of the only ones as of last Monday that was still um, talking about in person. Um, a, a major reason for that was I thought that we had all stakeholders on board. We started a group really be, before anyone that I'm aware of. We started meeting proactively to talk about this. We have newer schools, bigger schools with smaller enrollments at this time. And I was pretty confident that that was a, a, a driver for why we were in the position we're in. Um, but one thing that changed, um, I had sent out a survey. I had I had data from from our staff from our initial survey with a question that asked are you comfortable coming back to school in person with the current guidelines and it said currently three foot to six foot i had 70 um i had 86.3 percent of the staff say that they're likely to return in person 11.9 um, percent were neutral and 1.8 percent indicated they were not likely to return given those parameters and that's all staff that were surveyed and completed my survey that's not uh just the teachers but i did receive um, an email last Friday, the 24th, from the teachers union that they had done uh, an additional survey. This came at about um, one o'clock last Friday, and they said that there currently there is limited support for full-time in-person school when the school year resumes in September. Um, there is extremely strong support for social distancing protocols if and when return occurs. Nearly two out of three members support using the CDC guidelines of the six foot in construction of those protocols. So I followed up with Mr. Kane, who's the, the uh, president of the NREA, and it seems that we have a lot more middle ground to work with with a hybrid model. So again, my, my goal is to deliver as many students back to school as possible. I still believe that um, the, the safest time for students to come back right now, based on what students are doing out in the world, 
going to beaches, playing playing some sports with modifications on the fields. Um, I, I wouldn't be putting forward an in-person model if I didn't think that we could do it. But I do think that the, the larger charge that I have is to deliver to you today a model that I think actually can have traction, as, as uh, Mr. Kane goes on to say here as well, that you know we, we want to spend our time developing and, and coming up with the best model that's actually going to be able to be implemented. And so that is why my recommendation today is going to be that we talk about um, a hybrid model that would be as many students as possible coming back to school. It would be a two days on, two days off model. So my suggestion, we have four cohorts. I'll start, you know, there are some students, I'm calling the cohort D. Those students have already reached out to us or they still will have an opportunity to reach out to us to choose for a remote only option. So those are students who they do not feel comfortable coming back to school for, for any number of reasons, including a medical or pre-existing condition. So those students would have the option for full um, remote. And that would exist even if we were in an in-person model as well. We have another cohort. I'm going to call those cohort C. These are our high priority students. These are students who um, really would uh, have the most challenges with a, a remote model. I'm thinking of our substantially separate students who are 75% or more outside of the classroom, um, uh, the, you know, the inclusion classroom. These are our, our English language learners, our pre-K students who are, who are coming into us from early intervention, and some of the typical peers that are in those classrooms as well. So those students would receive, to the extent possible, coming in every day or nearly every day. And then for the majority of the students, um, we would divide those students into cohort A and cohort B. We've talked about different models of how to split this, but we would, you know, we really want to have a model that A, gets students in as much as possible, B, provides students with as much continuity and a, a, a schedule that they can wrap their heads around. And I want to provide that for parents as well. I want parents to be able to have a schedule that they can, they can be accustomed to that they understand. So the idea would be cohort A would attend on Mondays and Tuesdays. Cohort B would attend on Thursday and Friday. And we would use Wednesday in a couple of different ways. One thing is that we would, you know, make sure that we're cleaning and sanitizing in between the, the, the switching of the two cohorts. But there's a strong uh, suggestion from our principals, and I agree that we want to get students in as much as possible. So what we would most likely do is have students attending on Wednesdays for half a day. So one week it would be cohort A going three days, the next week it would be cohort B going three days. And so from parents, from trying to determine a schedule, they would, they would know, you know going in that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week is, is a day when students are in school, the next week it's Monday, Tuesday. And so it would be consistent, um, every week would be two days and then every other week would be three days. And we would, the proposal would be that we would do that at all three levels. What's good about that kind of a model, we also felt if we do at some point need to pivot into a full remote, it would be a very similar schedule to what students would be doing when they're remote. And so I know I shared um, some of these different ideas with you. That's the gist of our, our schedule. I'm sure that the, you know, the, the questions will come with the details. So if, if there are some questions, I'm sure I'm happy to answer those now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to open it up first to the committee, um, and if public members have questions or want to type them, them in or put their name, we'll get to the public as well. But I'll start with the committee. I don't know if anybody wants to start, and well, I'll I'll call on people. I'll start with Mr. McGowan because he's always uh, willing to give his opinion early. So, Mr. McGowan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on things. Thank you, Mr. Buckley, and thank you, Dr. Daly. I know this is. Uh, uh, been a tremendous amount of work even to get to this point and we haven't even uh, gotten to the full plan yet so um so i appreciate um all of what you said and uh, i setting aside for the moment my opinions on whether it should be a full in person or a hybrid uh model at the beginning uh one of the things that i've been thinking about a lot and i know i've mentioned to you and to mr buckley and a couple of others um, I guess, in, given the, the um, structure you just laid out, that we might consider a, um, a fifth cohort that might consist of as many of the younger uh, elementary students as possible 
and I don't know if the union would be open to uh, working with us on this, um, getting uh, the younger elementary school students in for full uh, for full in person. Um, based on the facts uh, on two assumed facts assumed on my part, um, one that the youngest uh, cohorts are, um, at, you know, the most uh, uh, are the least likely to uh, be susceptible to get, uh, contracting the disease and transmitting it, and also that uh, the youngest cohorts are, um, you know, will will benefit the least from a from any kind of remote learning, whether it's the the, the two days that they're not two two and a half days they're not in school or or um, or in a full uh, in a full remote situation. Is there any way that we can consider getting younger grades, you know, as many as we can, as we have the resources for, um, in on a full person model? Mr. McGowan, if I could just reply to some of that, um, <clears throat> to be clear, I, I don't know that it's an additional cohort. I think what we're talking about is expanding cohort C to include um, more students. Yes. And that is our goal. So I've already taken that suggestion to our principals. Um, I would start with kindergarten. Um, because we have a situation where we have a, a tuition-based kindergarten system, um, and we would think about that. There may be some other ways that we can look at kindergarten to change that, but um, I would like to see, again, I would like to see as many students in person as possible. So if we need to do six foot, um, one of the challenges is that we would need double the amount of classrooms to bring kids in at 50%. However, there will be a few classrooms available, and, and that that's, would be my goal. Now, the problem is how do we staff those rooms? Who's in there? What does that look like? Um, so the concept, which I haven't mentioned yet, is a concept that we're talking here about remote learning assistance. What it means is we're based for students that are in a situation where they, the remote learning is, is greatly a challenge. Um, for the student experience or for, you know, if both parents are working, where the students would be in remote, but they would be on campus. And so that's another avenue that we're exploring. We've ex we're exploring that quite honestly, in-house and also externally. I've spoken to some of our external providers about supporting us with that as well. Um, and just to, to answer a couple of questions that are in the chat, just so we're clear. Um, I think it's important, you know, we, we would certainly give consideration. And one of the reasons why all of the schedules are, are on the same schedule is to allow for as, as much as possible siblings in, in the same level, elementary, middle, or high, or in different levels to be on the same schedule. So that if, if uh, you know, an older child needs to be home to, to help out and assist with a younger child, we would schedule it that way. Remote learning at any stage, whether it's during the hybrid phase or in full remote, if we were to go to that, will be very, very different this year as well. Um, someone asked about before and after school, those programs are still very much on the table. And we, we are, there's a lot of challenges to the mixing and, and the, the, you know, trying to keep students uh, separate. What I'm told when I met with the YMCA is that they're keeping students in groups of less than 10 and maybe less than that. So some of the, the, the after school and before school uh, decisions might impact which classrooms you're in this year as we try to design things as well. One other piece that I failed to mention this morning that in addition to the information from the teachers union, the busing is also a factor in this. We, you know, Mr. Connolly confirmed with me this morning that we, we can transport everyone who put in for the busing at the hybrid model. With the full in-school model, we currently would have, uh, we would not have the ability to provide everyone who asked for busing the ability to come to school at the three foot distance. We would have to then revisit that list, think about those that are only within the legal required busing, which would be um, up to sixth grade or within two miles. I'm sorry, and beyond Daly, two miles. And, and, so, that's based on the, and that's based on the guidance from DESE, uh, from, the, from the Department of Education, uh, uh, stating that buses need to be at severely reduced capacity, right? Exactly. So that that is another variable as well. And I think it's fair to mention that we also, brought the question forward to the Department of Health, the Board of Health last night, for them to weigh in on their thoughts about whether three foot or six foot um, was was acceptable. They, they were not prepared to make a recommendation last night. They have told me that they are going to reconvene and give us more information on Sunday, but it's 
you know, I made it clear to them that I needed to submit something tomorrow. At this time, there was not a ringing endorsement for anything less than six feet. Um, but there, there also was, I, I don't think it's fair to, to say that they made a recommendation because they really did not last night. Um, just to clarify on the kindergarten payments, um, at, at this moment, we have, you know, our, our deadlines are the same, but we have extended a full refund up through September 1st, which will give parents at least um, you know, several weeks to, to fully have the final plan to decide whether that is the model that they want for their students this year. So the, the, there will be a full refund for those folks that have made a payment as of August 1st, because I think it's only fair to know exactly what you're enrolling your child in for this year. So I think that answers um, the questions here. Okay. So why don't we, why don't we go on Ms. Boutwell, do you have any comments? Yes, thanks, Scott. Um, so, you know, for me to be candid, um, you know, definitely a level of disappointment that we have the capabilities to go in person full time um, and sort of here we're pivoting after many, many discussions. Um, it seems rather odd to me that our survey of the teachers is so disjointed from that of the NREA. I don't know what had evolved in terms of opinions or if it's a true reflection of our teachers. Um, so definitely concerns there and just wanted to be clear. Um, I think the model that you put forward, um, you know, meeting the needs of, of the, the feedback that you received is good. Um, I don't know if on Wednesday you could consider a full day for folks and kind of do, not take a school day to do cleaning, maybe think about evenings or, or something of that nature. I don't know from a contractual perspective if that's even possible, but um, if we could you know, leverage as much time as humanly possible. And then the last piece is I feel like, I know that there's <coughs> cohort C and I know that's gonna be looked at. Um, right now, you know, when you talk about those that are 75% you know, pulled into a separate classroom or what have you, I think there's a whole cohort of kids that are on 504s and IEPs where remote learning doesn't really work for them. They need to be integrated with other kids as part of their um, part of their support. And I think that, you know, for, for those folks and others to feel separated and to be in sort of have different expectations of them <clears throat> school kind of puts them in a bucket yeah. that parents might not be happy about. So I feel like it, it's losing sight of that cohort a little bit, but I know that may be to come. Um, and then lastly, I completely agree with Rich. I think that even for elementary school as a whole, remote learning is not very um, effective and it puts a huge burden on parents. So the more um, you know, younger kids, even up to sixth, seventh grade that we could get in person would be the ideal scenario for me. So I guess I'm just disappointed this isn't the plan I would want to approve. And just to be clear, I appreciate that. We definitely will work to increase those younger grades. There, there is a pretty significant space limitation. When you have the six foot of distancing in the classrooms, um, we really do not have enough classrooms at, at the schools to do that. We could possibly talk about using other spaces in town for, for some students to come in. Um, yeah. So we've, we've explored that. It's not a very viable option at this time. So, and then I think with the three feet, um, you know, Patrick is the kid, if the parents are comfortable with the medical experts at the state saying their kids can be three feet apart, then let the kids be three feet apart and the teacher be six feet apart. The, the teachers don't have to get three feet from a student. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, honestly. Yeah. And just okay. to be clear, you know, and, and one thing that I want to be very clear about too, in my position, I, I don't want this to be pitting teachers against parents. And I want to be careful to avoid that. Um, we are all part of a team and we're working together. And, I, you know, all of this needs to be collectively bargained. These are changes in working conditions. Even asking someone to wear a mask is a change in working condition. And I want to be clear that, um, you know, if the teachers as a group feel uncomfortable coming back into this situation, then we have to negotiate and we have to bargain. And I want to do something that's going to be most effective for the students. Um, and so that's, that's, why I'm, I'm hearing what they're saying and trying to work to get to the most um, positive result for the students. Understood. Okay, thank you. And just to remind people, I know 
if people want to type questions, we'll try to answer them in between. But I do want to hear from the committee members before we just open it up to the public. Mm -hmm. For so going to Mrs. Imbriano. Mrs. Imbriano, do you have any thoughts or comments? Sorry, I had to figure out how to shut off or turn on my mic. Um, no, I, I know there's a lot of thought and consideration that's gone into this and a lot of around and round and round. Um, I, I also agree with Rich and Diana. Uh, I believe that the younger ones are better served in person than remote learning. So, but that's been stated many a time. So that's it. Thank you. Mr. Pavosilio? Um, just, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a couple of, of, of things, and I'll, I'll try and keep this brief so that uh, we have as much time as possible for the community. Uh, Dr. Daly, I just want to make sure I understand. So we, we have this plan that you have presented right now, just literally in front of us on this chat. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty detailed, and I, and I get the purpose of it. But basically, today, we're just voting on whether we're submitting a hybrid plan the specifics of it are still open to change over the, the coming week or so. Is that correct? Not entirely, Mr. Papa. So we are, we are voting to approve, um, or at least, you know, I, I don't even, yeah, I, I think we're going to vote to approve. I have to submit all three, you know, North Reading's approach to all three options. Sure. I have to re report on, you know, here's what we did for our feasibility study. Here's what we found would work for in-person, for hybrid, and for remote. And there's one question that asks, at this time, which of the three options are we leaning towards? Right. And, and on this, at this time, you know, which remodeling, uh, which reopening model within your plans are you leaning towards at the start of the school year? And so that is where I'm suggesting hybrid. But all of them are detailed, including a detailed plan about how we would support students um, in, in differentiated ways throughout the year. So Absolutely. this is just this is really for the department to gauge where we're at and to give us feedback that we then would include in our reopening plan that would be submitted after that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I mean I, I agree with what is a, a, a pretty obvious sentiment, um, although an important one, which is that we, you know, we we want to try and have as minimal an impact as possible to to how things are going. Well uh, to 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 our educational practices while respecting health risks and uh, and and being cognizant of that. Um, in person makes sense, however, when when it comes down to the argument that the teachers have made about three feet versus six feet, I I can understand the dilemma. Uh, as was brought up earlier, the CDC is still at six feet, and and that can be a hard thing to wrap your mind around going back to work suddenly, um, and there's confusion as there has been throughout all of coronavirus, uh, over what the best practices are to avoid. Um, as long as that's the case then, and three feet is impossible, then it sounds like full in-person is, is impossible based on our logistics. And I, I think that uh, Mr. McGowan had the right point, which is the most we can get in person is the best idea possible. And prioritizing from the youngest kids up makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Obviously, we'll have our, our challenges to getting any of them, but even if we can get one grade in, that's another 150 kids, and each additional grade beyond that, it makes a difference. Um, I feel for the parents, but uh, I think, Dr. Daly, you said it best at our last meeting, which is that there isn't going to be a solution here that makes people happy. We're just going to do the best that we can um, with this. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Thank you, Chris. And so I'll just give my thoughts as well. I think. I mean, I'm, I'm very frustrated to be perfectly honest right now because I feel like there's been a lack of leadership from the government down. Um, you know, DESC bringing out guidelines that are different than CDC and then putting it all in the districts to say, what well, you know, what do we want to do there? You know, and none of us are, are experts in health, you know, so for us, for the for five school committee members to be making a decision on, you know, is the CDC correct or are, is DESC's medical expert, are they correct? It's challenging and it's frustrating. And there are many interests to consider here. Um, it's not just, you know, the spread of COVID. There's also the mental health of students, social emotional learning. There, there are so many different competing interests here. Um, and it's just frustrating that it's being pushed down to each individual district to decide what they're going to do for health. And 
it's it's concerning to me. And so, I mean, my my own personal thoughts here. <clears throat> I think we've had a working group for months to try to talk about this, and it's extremely frustrating that these thoughts came out completely at the very end of this whole process. As Dr. Daly said, we surveyed teachers. We shared that survey with the teachers union before it was sent out to make sure they were okay with the questions that were going out to get the answers from that. We have not seen the survey that was done by the, the teachers union. We've only been told that two thirds of people don't feel comfortable coming back. And, you know, th that's concerning to me, honestly. And I think we, <clears throat> right now, DESE is saying we, we should put a plan in place to get as many students back as we can. We have a plan that allows everybody to be back three feet, which is DESE's guidelines. And so to me, I, I find it hard to go against that. Um, we went to the Board of Health last night to ask if they feel comfortable with the three feet and they wouldn't say they didn't feel comfortable or that they do feel comfortable with it and so we didn't get any you know ultimate guideline from there so we are left with dese giving us a mandate to get as many students back as we can with the ability to get everybody back the, the required three feet away and yet we are being you know asked whether we should do that or not and it's it's a no-win situation i mean i agree with my my fellow committee members that especially at the elementary level, I believe that remote learning just doesn't work as effectively as in person. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I don't know where to go from, from that part of it. Um, yeah, so th those, those are just my, my general thoughts on all of this. And uh, I think we've talked, we, we, we've read through most of the comments here. Um, and somebody did, is asking about the additional 10 days. We're gonna have to talk about that topic at the end of this. Um, but Dr. Daly, I want to make sure we've gotten through all the questions that have been typed in. And yep. I know Mr. I could Miller, just, go I ahead. Could just clarify one point, Mr. Buckley. I do, I did receive a, uh, the survey data from the NREA, and I just haven't shared it with the committee. So I, I just shared that now. I, I just had, I, I shared, I shared with you the gist of it, but I didn't give you the actual results. So that was shared. Okay. Thank you. I believe there's a question. I believe the question that we didn't get to. Um, was someone asked in development of the approaches to each option you're relying solely on data provided from agencies such as mass education board department of health who and cdc um I, I would say those are the the main providers of the data our local board of health cdc the world health organization um and and certainly what the the massachusetts department of education is providing us as well they, they're very strict guidelines and guidance that we're, we're following. Um, some of it is mandated and non-negotiable, and some of it um, is left to local decision. But I'm, at, at the moment, I'm not aware of what other uh, information we would be looking at. So I'm not sure if there's a follow-up to that question. There's a question about the, the, the 10 additional PD days. So it's not just to clarify on that, that it's not, the, the way the question's asked, um, you know, are we taking 10 additional days? That there's no option to take the days. The, day, the student year was cut from 180 days to 170 days. We, we now have to use those 10 days for professional development and training for teachers. There's no, there's no option on that um, unless, the, unless the teachers union said uh, we want to come back and, and have less than the 10 days, we possibly could negotiate that. But I, I, I'm not aware of any anyone that is doing that. Um, what what that means is we need to discuss this morning what the calendar would be, and that's a conversation we're going to have in a few moments, um, and, and to determine what what the start date is. We we would be revisiting the calendar. I would not be, um, you know, just just doing that willy nilly. If we if we were to start after the 16th, we would need a waiver, and so that's that's a. All those days, by the way, have to be used before the school year. We cannot, uh, you know, use five of them and then get out five days earlier in June. We can't do that. We can talk about the other two days that we had in the calendar, uh, which are professional development days for teachers. Um, but we do not. We cannot talk about the ten days. Um, will there be a survey to a parent to see how many parents would be willing or able to go fully online? Because uh, we may be able to lessen the amount of students in the building. So the, the survey that we've already sent out did provide us with that information, um, but that is a question we could ask again to see. Um, but you know, 
the, the able to go fully online is is about 99 percent there were there were uh 25 less than 25 respondents who said they had internet issues at home and we will be providing internet support for the families that have trouble so i i'm confident to say 100 percent will be able to go online um there was a certain number who indicated it was a very small number who indicated they were choosing to go online so we can definitely ask that question again as, as a follow-up from today to see if there are more that would rather go fully remote. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more from many districts about, and, and from the state, the, the MTA at the state level, the Teachers Association, about that. Um, does remote equal homeschooling so parents will be fully responsible for the children? No. So remote, when I'm talking about cohort D and remote, and even on the days when they're not in school, that is fully provided by the school. It is going to look very different than it did in the spring. I would expect students to be engaged all day and for teachers to be engaging with students. So there's someone on the school side is engaging with the students. That doesn't mean 100% of the time synchronously, but it does, it will involve much more. It's not going to be just doing homework or doing some assignments or checking in. Homeschooling is something completely different. If a parent wants to opt for homeschooling, they would complete a plan. That now is not provided for the district. Everything is provided for by the parents. And that is, a, that is an entirely different uh, process. So the, the, the design of the surveys from our surveys were designed by uh, members of the working group. And we, we tried our best um, to make sure that the questions were not leading and to be open-ended. Um, so follow-up question on the data being used, would you look at scientific medical journals that are publishing study results? We're, we're looking at them every day, but we are responding to the agencies that are, that are, that are processing those um, journals and that information. Dr. Daly, the surveys were not about, they were, they were not as much about scientific. It was more about, you know, what are your thoughts? Like with the information out there, we weren't trying to, we weren't trying to tell them what the, what is safe and what's not safe. We were just asking opinions based on the information that's out there. Sure. The uh, and and there are plenty of studies that are that are making good cases on both sides. There are plenty of op eds that are making good cases on both sides. Um, there is there is discussion about testing of students and teachers um, that is being discussed at the department. There is nothing definitive yet that's coming out about what will be available to schools for testing, as far as COVID testing in schools. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Daly, I just want to please comment on that because I think it's one of the most disappointing things about what the state has done uh, that they, you know, and I know they, they may be working on it and that's fine, but, uh, you know, good testing is one of the keys to bringing uh, kids and for, and for that matter society back to uh, closer to normal. And they, there was just not a lot in there, at, you know, in the guidance so far uh, about testing. And, and, you know, certainly the district, we, we don't have the, uh, the resources to, you know, to plan our own testing and do a, a high volume of testing. So um, that is definitely one of the more disappointing things about the guidance that's come from the state, in my opinion. I don't know if you want to call on some folks that, that are asking to raise questions. Um, why don't we finish up? So uh, Caitlin had a question here, in-person learning with three feet. Are we um, looking at K-1 to students sitting in desks in rows for the majority of the day, no small groups, no cooperative learning? Yes, that would be, the school day is going to look different because of the guidelines. So it's going to look a lot more like traditional education. It's going to be students in desks front facing. There's not going to be coming together at small tables. I mean, I, I fully, I'm fully confident that our teachers are going to find ways to make the in-person experience as close to the typical day as possible, but we're not going to have um, sitting on the rugs. We're not going to have, um, you know, everyone coming together in the library and sitting on, a, you know, chairs near each other. It's, it's going to be socially distanced. It's going to be very different. Um, masks are required. That's been very clear through this whole process grades two through 12 with strong recommendations for k to one as well 
to be clear, what we're going to do is create a culture that is very understanding and accepting that it's going to be very difficult for students to do that all day long. Um, but to be clear, it's, it's not, it's not something that's optional. And so, yes, classrooms are going to be very different, um, in a lot of ways in person. And, and to clarify, Dr. Daly, on that one, <clears throat> DESE does have protocols in place. So while they've while they've kicked the decision ultimately to school committees and superintendents about what model is chosen, whatever model is chosen, if you're in person, there are certain protocols that have to be in place. And one of them talks about the distancing of desks and they all have to face forward and things like that. So that is just the requirements that we have to do in order to have anybody in the schools. And the question about is there staffing to um, to connect with the remote, we, we have a few different plans that still have to be negotiated. So all of this has to be negotiated with our teachers union, but the way we're planning to, to do this, um, we're hoping to, to uh, my, my hope is to have the teacher able to teach in a different way so that the teacher is teaching the students in front of them and the students who are remotely in slightly different way. It's not gonna try to teach um, remote and in person. It's going to try to think about we're in a hybrid model, we're going to do hybrid teaching, and it's going to look a little bit differently. If we're not able to come to agreement on that, then we have to start talking about using our teaching staff and others in a different way. Um, there is some relief this year on, on folks being able to teach outside of their licensure area. Right now, you can teach one course, 20%, outside of your, your license area and there would be additional flexibility. The problem with that is that there would be um, possible less options and electives for students because now I need to use teachers in those elective categories to teach um, for academic subjects. And that is not my preferred method. I would much rather have the teacher teaching their original class of 20 to 24 students and they're teaching some of them in person and some of them remotely. And that's um, I'm still confident that we can get there, and that's what I am going to suggest strongly. Okay, and select board member, Mr. Studo has a question. Mr. Studo? Good morning. Um, thank you again, all of you. I know this is, uh, it's an impossible situation trying to find a reasonable solution. Um, one, the question I have on the surveys, uh, Dr. Daly, um, is there any way at least we can get clarification on the discrepancies between the teachers union one i think uh and ours just because i feel that you made one comment that rang a bell and made me ask we don't want any um friction between the teachers and parents however if we don't get that clarified i feel like how do you tell parents that you know what i mean like that needs to get explained because in my opinion uh, just because if there's any way we can reconcile the two, because saying, well, over here you were fine, but over here you weren't, and we're going to change our whole plan because of it. I mean, that's just not, I, I mean, it, it's almost like you're asking us as a leap of faith, just we got this. Like, so just, is there any way we can get clarification or reconcile the two surveys? Well, the clarification would be that, first of all, one was later, more recent data. There were more. There were many more specific questions around um, what you're more comfortable with. So we can certainly share that. I can I can ask the teachers union if they're comfortable sharing their survey and their data um, more publicly. You know, some districts have written an open letter in the newspaper or 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 taken their stance. You know, I, I if I had to predict, I think we may be seeing some more of that coming from the teachers union. Um, I don't know if, if, if Mr. Kane's on the call, he might be able to step in or someone else that wants to speak uh, there, but I'm not comfortable sharing their data without sort of um, discussing it with them first. But I think it is safe to say that in conversations I've had with him, um, you know, the questions that we asked were, are you comfortable coming back given these guidelines? And I was, I was told that, you know, things have changed. Things are different. Um, more data is out. More studies are out. We're seeing more, um, you know, upticks in cases, not necessarily in Massachusetts, but we're seeing, you know, Major League Baseball shut down. And, you know, things are, things are happening. And there's certainly, if you're, if you're following what's happening across the state, you're getting letters from Westford Public Schools, Wellesley Public Schools, and the Mass Teachers Association is kind of... Um, you know, bringing folks together to talk about their stance. So there's certainly a different climate than there was 
um, in the state, certainly, um, than there was when I put out the survey a few weeks ago. I mean, that's clarification. Without giving you the specific data um, at, at this meeting, I'm not comfortable doing that, but we can certainly go back and say that that's um, important. I, I, I don't disagree that I, I don't want to, to pit anyone against anyone, and I, and I don't want to make this on the backs of the teachers because I think um, they, they do have a right. This is their job, and they are the majority of the workers in this district, and if they are uncomfortable coming back under the conditions we propose for in person, then it's their right to to express that. So, thank you. Okay. And I think uh, Ms. Donahue asked about the timing of the surveys. I think the first one, and they were probably a month or two apart, I believe, right, Dr. Dilling? Do you know? I'm I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Do, do you know the timing of the surveys? When when the remote learning group survey was, and when the Second survey was. I, I can double check. It's it's, it's um I want to say two two weeks ago for for the district survey. I know that the data that I have from the teachers union is from from July twenty first. I mean, ultimately, people are frustrated and people are going to be frustrated. I'm frustrated. I'm more frustrated at DESE for kicking this to individual schools and then pitting schools against each other and. You know, teachers are parents in other communities and they have kids that are staying home and, you know, one school district doing this and others doing that. And, you know, we have to work with the unions. And I just I think the public needs to understand why we're doing this and the, and the differing inf information, because you hear some people saying, well, we can be back remote and you're choosing not to be back remote. You know, and then you have other people saying, why? Why is anybody opening at all? And so I just think it's important for the public to understand the reason behind this and where we're getting to this plan. Ultimately, as a school committee, we have to approve a plan going forward. And so we have to get to some sort of yes vote today. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of where we're at. <clears throat> I think another question or two, and then I think we'll just go to a vote just to approve the plan that has been that has been put before us. Um, <clears throat> So the, yeah, Dr. Dr. Dale, do you want to look at uh, Cassandra's question as well? I'm answering that question now. That okay. Be, to be different, um, this year students do need to be engaged when they are in remote. It's going to look different. And so the idea is that students will follow a schedule, whether you're home in full remote, whether you're home on a hybrid, you will need to follow that schedule. That's, that's coming straight from the Department of Education. Um, it was very different. In the spring, we were all adjusting and reacting to something that happened on a, on a moment's notice. We now have time to plan for this, and this is what it will need to look like. This is why the, the, the solution to the, the situation that she has um, expressed um, is that we will really try to have remote learning assistance available to working families. Um, I don't know that we can provide that for everyone who asks. I don't know that that is uh, something that's going to have a have a fee to it. I'm not I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but we're going to try to figure out what that looks like for families. I know the YMCA would be willing to to offer something as well um, that they would host on those days because I, I think you're going to have teachers who are working parents and staff members who are working parents who have to make these same decisions in their districts. Everybody's reacting to many different plans. Uh, we're doing a two day on two day off model. Other districts are doing other things, and so everyone has. Uh, not everyone, but many many of our staff have children at home that they have to make these decisions about as well. So it's it's certainly not optimal. It's not anything any of us are choosing. You know, we all want to be back in school um, in a typical way, but that's not possible at this time. I do think, given the time, Mr. Buckley, you probably need to um, go to vote. Talk about yeah. this and then talk about the schedule. Yeah, and the only other, the only other comment I would say is the the one challenge I have with this plan also is that there's no metrics in place about when we go to a different one. Like I understand there's fear and there's, you know, but it, it, it's challenging. Like the state has tried to lay out guidelines and that's something I think we really need to work on um, going forward, maybe with the Board of Health, with other groups about when is it safe to come back and when is it not even safe to be doing hybrid, you know? And that's the one thing that I don't think we've really addressed here and that's not required right now, but I think that's when we need to shift. So at, at this time, I think we need to, I, I, I would entertain a motion to approve the 
plan that uh, Dr. Daly has set forward, which involves uh, uh, opening with a hybrid plan and endorses the three different models. So Scott, I'll offer a motion, but I, I what I would say is uh, uh, I move that the committee vote to approve the submission Dr. Daly has presented to us uh, uh, his submission to the DESE, which outline which includes outlines of how we would address three the three scenarios and indicates that at the moment we are looking at the hybrid as our go forward plan. I'll second. Okay, so we have to do a roll call vote. So on your motion, Mr. McGowan. Aye. Mrs. Imbriano. Aye. Mr. Papa Basilio. Aye. Uh, Mrs. Boutwell. Nay. And and I'm, <clears throat> and again, I, I think uh, Mr. McGowan crafted it very well, but I still, I think we need to approve something to go forward. So it has to be three and we have the three, but I still have concerns about, you know, about what the guidelines from DESE are. And so I will also vote nay. So the motion will carry three to two. And thank you everyone. <clears throat> and I would, so uh, Dr. Daly, do we also need to talk about the schedule now too and, and the 10 we days? Do. So what, what I would propose is that we, we come up with a tentative schedule for today um, that we can share out. And then at our next meeting, we can officially vote on a new calendar. My suggestion, I just to, you know, I, I discussed with uh, Mr. Peter Kane from the NREA for the possibility of what we would do with those 10 days and how we would use those 10 days. Um, we had originally had some conversations when we set the calendar at, at the beginning of the year to start after Labor Day. If you recall, it seems like a thousand years ago, but we were discussing that last year um, for this year. And at that time, we discussed the possibility of the teachers coming back prior to Labor Day with the students coming back after. There was some discussion, but ultimately we decided that everyone starts after Labor Day. Um, given the, the, the urgency to bring all of our students back in, into this hybrid model and to start it as smoothly as possible. I made some suggestions and we discussed possibly having the teachers come back for one day on September 3rd, which would allow the students to start on the 21st. Remember that everything that I need to do um, would require a waiver if we go beyond the 16th. Um, if the teachers came back on September 3rd and did not come back on September 4th, we would be able to start on the 21st, which would give us a clean start for the Monday of our cohort on the 21st. That is a bit late, and I did hear from some of you as well that that was a bit late. We also discussed having the teachers come back on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, not coming back on the 4th, which would allow us to begin on the 17th. So I would be requesting a one-day um, waiver from the state for folks to come back on the 17th. We would probably start then with the cohort B for two days and then cohort A. And on top of this, just let me be clear, I also would be suggesting that we do um, some small trials and runs with students on those 10 days. So part of the training for the teachers would be with students where we would bring in, um, you know, maybe one class or one grade here or there to try out a bus run to practice all of those things so that we're ready for um, our actual model to begin on the day that we decide for the first day. The teachers union um, ultimately got back to me yesterday and rejected both of those proposals suggested that we begin on uh, the original day, which would be September 8th, which would mean that students would start on the second, the 22nd of September, which is a Tuesday, which at this time, I do not think that is a good suggestion. I do not like the idea of starting a two day on, two day off model on a Tuesday. It does not make sense to me. Um, and so my suggestion to you, if we, I, I would just say, if we are to start on September 1st, which is, again, the, the teachers union consults on the calendar, but ultimately the committee decides on the calendar. If our teachers cannot start any earlier than September 1st, if they were to come back September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, uh, and 4th, and then work 8, 9, 10, 11, and then also the next week, we would then be able to start on the 16th, and we would not need a waiver. So we would be starting on that Wednesday. We would figure out what that day looks like, um, but that would be a possibility that we'd start on the 16th and not need to go through the process of requesting a waiver. So I leave this up to the folks here to uh, propose a, a tentative schedule. 
So, Dr. Dale, I have a quick clarification question. <clears throat> so, what has happened so far is DESE has said the school calendar year can be 10 days less. There can be 10 days that are teaching days. So now we're down to 170 days. Correct. But it also it said that we have to begin on September 16th. To get a waiver to begin later than that, will that be reducing the total number of days for the students or will it be kicking it back later? It's just it's just starting later. It's just the student. My understanding is that the students are supposed to start on the 16th. And if we if I need to request a waiver, it would be to start later than the 16th. But, but we're, we're already we're already ending late this year. And so if we kick it back another two days or three days or four days, we just end that many days later, correct? It's just a later start. The, the, you know, the commissioner put that date in there because he does not want the message to be that students aren't coming back until the 17th. He, they, he wants all students back in school on the 16th. And if, if we need later than that, we have to do a waiver. He understands that, that for those districts that were already starting after Labor Day, they may need a waiver and that's why he's allowing the waiver. A lot of districts are not doing that. A lot of districts are starting on August 31st, let's say, and then the 16th is the natural starting date for those districts. Okay, so the last day of school would still be the same and there would be no reduction. There would still be 170 days. Well, right. with the current with the current calendar of, of like June 29th, correct? Well, yeah, w w well, whatever, if we started on September 22nd, even, even then, would we still get 170 days in and end on the same day? I'm just trying to. We we would. Okay. It would, it would I, I'm not I'm not confident that that would be approved by the by the Department of Education. Yeah. So what we're saying is any 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 whatever our start date is, whether it's on or before the 16th or afterwards with a waiver, we still have to get 170 days. So we're in danger if we do get a waiver. If we do start after the 16th, we're in danger of running into running out of days, uh, especially if we have um, uh, well, snow days and, and, and all that. Uh, uh, but we'd be in danger of running up against that June 30th uh, uh, deadline is what you're saying, is what, is what you're worried about, Scott, right? Yeah. Interestingly, to clarify, it was asked yesterday on a call whether there is a such thing as a snow day anymore. And we, we are operating under those don't exist. It would be remote learning yeah, days. Interesting. Yeah. So we would That's be able to point. not have snow yeah. days. Um, so that does give us uh, that does give, which could, that which does could give allow us, us out a little bit earlier in June. And j just for the record, I'll clarify that Mrs. Boutwell had to drop off the call, so we have four committee members here now. <clears throat> so, I mean, my thoughts on this, I'll I'll jump out first in this one and just say, I think September twenty second is too late to begin. I mean, if I I would be you know, more than willing to work with a waiver for the with the teachers union to try to do something that's convenient for them, where we begin on a Monday and it's not, you know, that late. Um, if I look at the calendar, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, September 22nd is a Tuesday later on. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's very, very late. And so I don't, I, I, I prefer not to do, I, I wouldn't want to do that one. Um, I would, I would frankly rather get back as soon as we can. And so I would, you know, if, if we can't come to some sort of resolution that everybody likes, I, I say we try to not need a waiver and just get back on September 16th as we're being told we have to do. And then we move up the start, the official start date, but then students come back on the 16th. But I'd be open to hearing other arguments to start a couple days later. Um, but I, I think only only with the, with the consensus and agreement, otherwise I would say we, we should start as early as we can. I don't know what other people's thoughts are. Rich. So my, I, I would, I would say I agree. I don't, I don't. Uh, given, you know, I, I, I think we're already, uh, you know, I, I think it would be a lot to ask to, for parents to, to wait. Even, even the sixteenth is hard. So I think we should uh, um, apply these ten days as we see, you know, whatever seems to work best for, for. Um, getting the getting classes started for at, at the full level or whatever our full level is uh, by the 16th so wh however that works backwards but i think it's an important point too that dr daly made that we may be you know parents should keep in mind that we may be trying to do some um i guess you might call pilot testing in the few, in the days leading up to the 16th but in terms of the uh, actual schedule i would agree with you scott that um 
uh, we shouldn't start any later than the 16th. Chris, thoughts? Um, I agree with what you guys are saying. If, uh, <laughs> if administration and, and teachers have a common ground on what they think is the best starting point, uh, 16th or earlier, that's great. And if not, then we'll, um, we'll just have to make something fit because I, I, I agree. I don't think we should um, go out of our way to push back the start date. Janine? Well, just to, clar okay. just to clarify, I mean, the First teachers, the, the, the teachers ahead, we're, we're, we're not an approved. We're not approved. We're not ag agreeing with uh, a schedule that has them in, in the 10 day period starting prior to the 8th, right? Dr. Bailey? Right. So we're Correct. making this decision, uh, you know, ex the teachers. To, to agree with the teachers would be to start with students on the 22nd, which is a Tuesday. I cannot recommend that. I, I could be, you know, I, I think I think there are other dates that we could consider that are that are that are earlier than that. Um, I, you know, the 21st at least is on a Monday and that's clean. Um, but I know that that's that's late. And, and I don't know that that would be approved. Um, I, I could, I would be comfortable asking for the 21st. The 17th would be uh, starting on a Thursday, which would just basically start with the cohort B coming in those days. That would allow the teachers to come back the first, second, and third and have the Friday off very traditionally. And to be clear, in those districts where they have negotiated to come back on August 31st prior to September 1st, they have in their contracts that they have the Friday before Labor Day off. To start on the 16th, we would be asking the teachers to come back on the Friday before Labor Day, which is which is very commonly not a day that, that folks that start before Labor Day are required to work. So if we were to start on the 17th, that would be they would be working the first, second, and third, and they would have that Friday off. We would then, but we would need to request a waiver for that one day. So I, I, that's a good point, and you, you said that already, and, and it's good that you reiterated. I, I, I can see how the 17th makes sense as the beginning of, a, of one cohort's you know, two days. That, that certainly would make sense. I, I guess I could be in favor of that as well and asking for the one-day waiver. Yeah, I, I think the 17th makes the most sense personally, and I think I, I'd like to get you know, an agreement from people, but I, I, I believe the 17th works the best. Janine, you have thoughts? No, I... I... I'm in agreement. The seventeenth works. So my my uh, next step would be to request the waiver. I, I'm fairly confident that giving us a one day waiver would would pass. If I explain that we will traditionally start after Labor Day, our contract allows us to start no earlier than September first. We'd ask the teachers to work the first, second, and third. That would impact now our new teacher orientation, which was scheduled. For the first and second, I would be rescheduling that to Monday, August 31st, um, and I would be combining the two days into one. Quite honestly, it's it's you know it may even be virtual for for some of the parts of it. So I think we can do that uh, in one day. Um, I may have to do a second day later in the year as a part of our our new teacher orientation program, but I would do that on the one day on the 31st. They would work on the first, second, and third. They would have the Friday off before the Labor Day weekend. They would come back, work the 8, 9, 10, 11, and then do a, um, then when they come back that next week, there would be a few days of training and the, the students would begin reporting for their full days of school on the 17th. Like I said before, I would, I would look at that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as three days that we would be um, doing some work with students. So parents, from a planning standpoint, what I would say is that first, that Monday, um, the week of the um, 14th, 14th, 15th, and 16th, those are days when students should plan to be in North Reading because I think what you might be hearing is, you know, that's the day we might do the sixth grade walkabout. And because there's going to be so many transitions just for students to understand which doors they're entering this year, which, you know, what a bus is going to look like. Um, which bathrooms they can use, which ways to walk in the hallways, all of those pieces um, that I think would make a lot of sense to bring in much smaller groups than, a, than even the 50% just to walk through the day and to get a sense of what they're doing. And those, those days will certainly give parents and students an opportunity to think about whether they're comfortable coming in um, or whether they want to, to, to move into that cohort D and do more remote work. You know, that, I could see that happening if, if a student says there's no way I can 
can can do this, I think we would respectfully allow them to move into that cohort if they needed to. Okay. So it sounds like we have a consensus to try to aim for the 17th where we start there. Um, yeah, and again, I mean, if just because some kids are in school, the other kids will be starting their remote that day as well, so. Um, right, everybody's starting, it's just where, right. where they are. So we don't need to vote on this right now. This is just kind of advisory and we'll vote on the calendar later, Dr. Daly. I, I think what you're doing is this is the discussion for a tentative agreement that I will I will communicate out to uh, folks as tentative. I will request the waiver and once that's approved, I then think at our next meeting, I'm, I'm hoping that that process is pretty simple. Um, we will be able to vote on an amended calendar, which again, you know, there may even be some other conversations we have, but at, at this time, it doesn't impact the other end of the of the calendar too much, other than what I shared earlier. You know, we still have to plan for five days with um, with snow days, but I think that whole conversation was blown out of the water in March, right? About the idea of what is a snow day, and if we're if we're doing some days this year that are remote days, then I think a snow day could also be a remote day. So that that was clarified by the commissioner yesterday. So I think, you know. We, we will not have to be as concerned with those. You know, that was one of the big concerns was right now the, the last day of school is the 29th. But I think if we can think in terms indifferently in terms of the, the snow days, um, it, it would not be quite that late, which is which is a positive for our calendar. Okay. So I will be moving ahead just to clarify, I will be submitting this to the to the um, to the state for their approval. I will communicate out to parents the gist of what was submitted today with you know the, the 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 germ of this model with cohorts just some information and asking you know i will be actively asking for their feedback i will have uh, a form for them to submit some feedback and also some forums my plan is to have um, a few drop-in sessions uh on monday one for students specifically that uh, obviously for younger students, parents can attend and, and help facilitate, but I really want to hear student voice and then others for, for the parent voice. And then possibly another one also for some, some educators as well that's, that's open uh, for folks to weigh in. So that, that will be my goal to, to set those up and to communicate that out later today or, or early tomorrow um, to have more information. And then the final plan is right on schedule to what we've discussed all along that would be more comprehensive and just detailed on August uh, 10th. And I'm sure between now and then there'll be lots of feedback, there'll be lots developing in the news, and we'll have more information and input from the department on this original uh, submission, hopefully on Tuesday is what they said. And so I think the only other topic potentially is the next meeting. I know we had originally had some times and there were some conflicts. I know Ms. Boutwell, and, uh, Ms. Boutwell unfortunately had to drop off, but do we know was there a consensus on when we can have our next meeting to approve the, the meeting before the 10th or? We have not yet had a, a consensus on that. I, you know, I'm hoping that it's not too early. That's part of the, the concern is there's so much changing. I don't want this to be too early. Uh, I know that there were some challenges with the Friday date. Then we moved to Thursday, the 6th. There were some challenges on both ends, both early and late. Um, I think one member is not able to participate in each of those circumstances. So yeah, what just, to be, just to clarify, and I, I think I sent this, but in case it got missed in all the other traffic, um, Friday morning, I, it would be difficult for me just because I'm, I'm traveling, but I should be able to at least call in a, for any meeting, uh, you know, noon on on Friday. So do we want to suggest uh, the afternoons are difficult for you, Chris? Can you do the afternoon on a Friday? Uh, uh, yeah, my brother-in-law is getting married on the afternoon of Friday. So, well, that whole week is tricky. Friday afternoon is a is a complete non-starter. I, I just be able to. Um, I can do Friday morning. I can do Thursday morning. And if we want to try and do the afternoon or evenings, Thursday or earlier in the week, I will try my best. I, I, I can't promise, but I can. Like Rich said, I can. I can try and get on the phone to uh, to be there yeah, for. So so Chris, that, that's fine. My, my travel consists of being in the car. So at worst case, Friday morning, I can just be on the phone, you know, while we're driving or, or, or whatever. So um, I would say take my considerations out of the equation and, and schedule whatever works best for everybody else. Well, one other one other idea would be there's a special town meeting on Saturday. 
would we want to do like would anybody be open to like a Saturday at noon or something? The special town meeting starts at nine a.m. I don't know if people would be if that gives Chris enough recovery time from the wedding for noon on Saturday. Yeah. And we have, we typically don't go on the weekends, but like I think this is an important discussion, and so I'd love to I'd love to be able to have everybody there. I don't know if that would work yeah, for different. I mean, people. it's up to Dr. Daly if that's well. I mean, I'll like I say, I can be on the phone uh, re really pretty much any time on a Friday. So if we can do a Friday morning, that might be the, the best thing. Friday morning would work but, um, for me. But I'll leave that up to Dr. Daly whether he wants to wait as long as possible. He could wait till Saturday, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, it, it's that sweet spot. I mean, I definitely don't want to do it too early. But I also, if if you reject major portions of this, I've only got uh, exactly. very little time to get it ready for Monday. <laughs> um exactly. so if we can do friday morning rich i know that's difficult being in the car but if you're willing to do that that would probably be ideal give me the work day to then interact with with folks here that might have to provide input um into the plan from all my all my administrators i think that would be that would be a little bit more advantageous for us um and then if we if we need to follow up we then also have saturday to follow up if we decide we need to come back together to, to review something. So if that works, I would propose 8 a.m. on Friday the 7th, similar to today. I'm okay with that. Okay. that does that work for everyone? Ms. Imbriana, does that work for you? It does work for me, but we already have a meeting scheduled for the 6th, so are we just uh, moving that one then? Yes, yes. That, that meeting was okay. not able to be uh, attended by someone. I can't remember. I think it was Ms. Fowler or Mr. Papadopoulos. So okay. I'm going to move that sixth meeting to the seventh at 8 a.m. and I'll I'll email everyone just to confirm that. Okay. I don't okay. think there are any more. I think we have um, answered all the questions in the chat that have popped up. Um, so I think. Um, Can entertain a motion to adjourn. Yeah, there's a. So moved. I see. Let's, hang on, Mr. Miller was asking where to send follow-up questions. You can always send them to Dr. Daly, but he indicated he's going to be sending out some materials that you can write back to, and I think that's just to try to have it all in one place. Am I correct, Dr. Daly? Yeah, so I'm going to be hopefully later today sending something out um, to the community with, with specific channels to collect feedback in one place. So to me, that's the best way to do it. You know, you can email me, but I'd rather see it in the survey, and then, then it's reflected in, in the data that it gets shared um you know that way so um and just for clarification are you going to file for a meeting possibly on saturday the um eighth just in case do you think that's a good idea mr buckley just to have a, a second meeting or i mean if, if you think there's going to be much controversial i mean we can always put it on the calendar and cancel it if we don't need it at the same time i don't know that again i don't know that i'm gonna you know i don't know that i'm gonna feel comfortable interjecting my opinion on what the plan should be too much over you know over what the administrators come up with i think in today's meeting my concern was more desc has given us certain guidance that we're supposed to be following <clears throat> but ultimately we have a plan and we all knew we had to approve a plan today ultimately i think if the administration comes up with a I think if the administration comes up with a plan, I think we need to uh, pretty much support it. So I don't know. If you want to file for the sixes for the Saturday just to be safe, we can. But I don't I mean, know. Uh, I, I would have up until uh, you know 48 hours to make that decision too. So we can talk about it a little bit this week. Yeah. Uh, yeah if if anything but changes and or if might be might be like good for the committee members to hold the save the date um, for both the Friday and the Saturday at this moment. And then I will we'll, we'll make a decision on that um, as we get closer. If if things start to uh, really change and shift this week and, and into next week politically um, across the state, where what we're talking about today is different than what we're talking about with our actual plan, I think it, we might need the two days. <laughs> so we'll we'll revisit that next week. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Okay, and so we'll need a, a motion to adjourn. For the record, Papa uh, Chris Papa Basilio had to drop off the meeting, so there's three members left. Um, I made the motion. Made I think Rich seconded yep. it. I second. Okay. And I will do a roll call vote. Janine. Aye. Rich. Aye. I'm an I as well. 
and Chris and Diana are not here, correct? Correct. correct. Passes three to zero. All Thank right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.